information, the body of history, that American high school students would learn about black history, about African American history. This is pretty much it. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. You would learn something about Frederick Douglass um, and Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War and the emancipation of the slaves, Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. You would learn about slavery in general, about slavery as something that happened. And you would learn about some prominent African Americans who've achieved, like George Washington Carver, who's considered an inventor. And again, you would learn something about um, white racism, like the Ku Klux Klan in general, or maybe even Jim Crow. And maybe you would get into some alternative black movements like those of, of Malcolm X. But that's it. And in general, you've got to say that's a pretty oversimplified history. And after a while, it really starts to turn into something of, of a boring um, history. So too often, those categories of black history, those common tales of individuals we see again and again are oversimplified, especially oversimplified in terms of dates. After all, the story of Abraham Lincoln, the white president who supposedly emancipated the slaves, the story of Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, and of Frederick Douglass are confined to, give or take 10 years, confined to 1860. The story of Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and their battles against the Ku Klux Klan in the South, and battles for school and social desegregation in places like Little Rock and Birmingham are again confined to 1960, give or take 10 years. So there is the story of millions of African Americans over hundreds of years in the United States and the continental Americas confined to two 10-year periods. That's got to be an oversimplification. So to quote the singer Bob Marley, who had a keen eye on history and who was quoting from the Old Testament Book of Kings, he says, half the story has never been told. And a recent book on African-American slavery and its contribution to ca capitalism also used that title, half the story has never been told. So our question, is that true when it comes to black history? Has black history been oversimplified? And is Bob Marley right? Half the story has never been told. On September 23rd and 24th, 2016, a new Smithsonian Museum opened in Washington, D.C. And on the Saturday, there was a grand opening ceremony, the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C. So here we are, 2016, the Smithsonian Institution began in the 19th century. And here we are, 2016, an African-American Museum of History uh, finally opens. So perhaps half the story, the other half of the story, will soon be told. And black history will be less oversimplified and become related for the complex tale of agents and victims, but also agents who manage their own destiny and push back against their circumstances. So if we are to examine um, African-American history during an often overlooked period, 1880, 1890, right up to 1930, we have to skip back a little bit to the Civil War. And we note that Lincoln did emancipate the slaves of the Confederacy during the Civil War. In general, it can be said that the Civil War was over, was because of slavery. And you can have a complex debate about that, but ultimately, Slavery is the primary cause. So Lincoln emancipates the slaves during the war in the Confederate states. Then when the South loses, the Southern states, the Confederacy lose the Civil War, the North begins a process called Reconstruction, which means basically enforcing the rights of African Americans in the South, ensuring the Confederate powers don't dominate the South again, and ensuring equal protection of the law and abolishment of slavery, the 13th and 14th Amendments. However, the North soon loses its appetite for that. Sympathy for the Southern, the old Southern Confederacy grows and soon starts to reestablish itself. The North federal government turns away from watching the South or aiding African Americans in the South. Republicanism, meaning free men, free soil, free labor, the Republican Party of Lincoln turns away from the South. 
And so this allows the old confederacy to reemerge two ways. The old confederacy reemerges in the form of Jim Crow laws. That's the nickname given to laws throughout the southern states that started resegregating whites and blacks in all kinds of um, aspects of life, including travel, accommodations, education, voting, owning property. These Jim Crow laws start to proliferate in the South. And then to assist resegregation, to assist the denial of equal protection for blacks in the South comes a campaign of terrorism. A campaign of terrorism most famously in the form of the Ku Klux Klan and other similar groups and a form of murder of African Americans through, lynch, through lynchings, mass lynchings of African Americans, burnings of African Americans and later bombings and shootings of African Americans throughout this period ensuring, as a campaign of terrorism does, that a subject population is terrorized and won't stand up for its rights. So what many people know about is the great debate during this period. Hist African American history during this period, 1880 to 1930, often gets boiled down to two men, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And it often gets boiled down to these two men having two sharply different perspectives. That's what's alleged, that they had sharply different perspectives. So Booker T. Washington, who himself had been a slave and was emancipated at the end of the Civil War, was somewhat self-educated and then founds his own schools, industrial schools, such as the Tuskegee Institute. And in his famous Atlanta address, he says that African Americans cannot succeed in overthrowing the behemoth, the giant of Jim Crow, they cannot take segregation on head first. What they should do is concentrate on self-help, self-reliance. African Americans should build on separation and they should build on their own achievements. A model of self-sufficiency, a model of industry, a model of education, a model of thrift. Thrift meaning don't waste your money, save your money, invest your money. African Americans should look to themselves, should achieve themselves, and that way one day they will be too strong or they will outlast and outlive segregation. They will be too strong, too educated, too wealthy. Segregation just won't work anymore. But taking it on head first would be, to Booker T. Washington, a waste of time and lives and it would be suicide. Let's look inward, he says. This view is often contrasted with that of W.E.B. Du Bois. And the two men are somewhat contrasting also. Whereas Booker T. Washington had been enslaved and is self-educated, W.E.B. Du Bois is educated at the premier institutes around the world. He works with Max Weber, perhaps the most famous sociologist since Karl Marx. Du Bois works with him. He lives in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is, which is a far cry from post-Confederacy Georgia, where Booker T. Washington is. And Du Bois advocates a militant approach. Not an outright violent response, but a direct response. Yes, take on and resist segregation. Yes, resist the, the, for, the new confederacy. Do not give up your rights. And so he criticizes significant, he launches significant criticisms of Booker T. Washington and tries to break Booker T. Washington's hold on black political organizations. And so he starts to advocate true groups like the NAACP and others and they aim to take on segregation and Jim Crow head first. And one of the oft overlooked figures of this period, or someone who's kind of marginalized or sidelined, is Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey is a Jamaican, born in Jamaica, who comes to the United States and begins to preach and begins to found what he calls the United Negro Improvement Association. And Marcus Garvey's philosophy is fascinating. This is an era of self-help of looking within yourself and improving your self-motivation and clarity of mind and clarity of purpose. And Marcus Garvey wants to apply this to what he calls the entire Negro race. He thinks African Americans, again, should not confine themselves to, should not confine themselves to fighting segregation. They should confine themselves to self-improvement. And this becomes a very popular idea and his United Negro Improvement Association becomes very popular. It's, a, it's one of the largest African-American clubs or organizations of the era. And there are significant educational initiatives, female clubs, marches, 
They wear uniforms. He wants to set up black businesses, black forms of investment, even a black star line, a black shipping or black cruise line that would travel from Europe to the Americas, from Africa to the Americas. Marcus Garvey's UNIA movement often gets dismissed as, quote-unquote, a back-to-Africa movement, and where Marcus Garvey focused on Africa and said, Africa is a source of our pride, we should be proud as African Americans, and Africa is a source where we should invest, and yes, we could look at living in Africa also as an independent nation. After all, he said, looking around, the Irish congregate together in America, the Italians congregate together, why should not the descendants of Africa congregate together? But as we've described, there's so much more to Marcus Garvey and Marcus Garvey's movement than simply, quote-unquote, back to Africa. In fact, in Bob Marley's song, Redemption Song, Bob Marley honors Marcus Garvey, who Bob Marley and Rastafarians consider a prophet. Bob Marley honors Marcus Garvey by using the lyrics, Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Number ourselves can free our mind. That's what Marcus Garvey advocated for African Americans. He said, yes, there are these wrongs perpetrated on us, but we should emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. And that was the philosophy of the UNIA, and that's why it became such a popular movement from about 1920 up to 1940. And Marcus Garvey deserves his place in history and deserves not to be overlooked, given how popular his movement was and how effective it was in raising black institutions and black pride during this era. Another often overlooked figure during this era is that of Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells is the author of Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Forms. Ida B. Wells is considered a journalist, an advocate, and she documented lynch law in the South. She made sure to turn a light on lynch law. She would bear witness, the idea of bearing witness to the campaign of terrorism against blacks in the South whereas many would have preferred not to talk about or discuss or look upon lynching, Ida B. Wells made sure that she would document these extrajudicial, these illegal killings. And she would document cases of lynching in detail. So whereas it might be easy for Southerners to dismiss an African American who was lynched as someone who was doing something wrong, or someone who must have done something wrong, who must have preyed on white women, or must have preyed on white property, and got what they deserved from upstanding people in the mob, in the lynch mob, Ida B. Wells would examine these cases in detail and prove that this was a lawless killing, and prove that in many cases these people were innocent, completely innocent, or deserving of further investigation. And this made people carrying out these lynchings very uncomfortable, people who were onto these lynchings covered up, or people who figured these lynchings were not so serious. And this required a lot of personal bravery and sacrifice on the part of Ida B. Wells. And she was also an energetic writer and advocate on other matters and promoted African-American organization amongst African-American women in groups like the NAACP and elsewhere. And she also was involved in boycotting transport, transportation that would not um, embrace integration that segregated rail cars, etc. So another prominent figure who was an agent who took things into her own hands and responded to segregation using her skills as a journalist, using her skills as an advocate, was Ida B. Wells. So when we take the period 1880, 1890, right up to 1930 as a whole, we see that this is an often overlooked period of black history. Black history also often gets confined to the 1860s, often gets confined to the 1960s. But what about this intervening period? We see some giants of African-American history who were facing some of the worst eras of repression of African-Americans. A brutal era of terrorism and also a brutal era of legal segregation, where after the court case, Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, this idea, the great lie of we would treat the races equally but treat them separately, was very popular in the South and enforced through terrorism, through the Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist groups, and Jim Crow laws legally, we see many African Americans responding to that. Responding to it, though, in different ways, using their skill sets. So African Americans during the period were definitely victims.